Hey everybody, welcome to Storyline Worship Online. I'm Ty Gibson, and I want to invite you to engage in a rather serious Bible study with me right now. So wherever you are in the world, just grab a Bible, get comfortable there on your sofa or wherever you happen to be, and open the Bible, and let's explore what Scripture has to say about our present time in history. Certainly you've noticed that we are experiencing in the United States of America and to a large degree in the world as a whole, a great deal of social upheaval. There's a lot of pain. And I want to address with you today one aspect of the pain that I think is being largely overlooked. Now, in order to get there, I want to begin with the prophet Jeremiah, who is giving us what we might call a diagnosis of the human condition, the psychological and emotional condition of human beings. What's going on inside of us? God, through Jeremiah, says that the heart, the human heart, collectively is whole. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then the rhetorical question is posed, who can know it? The obviously implied answer is, well, none of us, we don't know our own hearts. We are inclined to self-deception. Well, then the passage goes on and tells us that God will engage in a judgment process to close up human history. And the judgment process that God will engage in will be a judgment process that brings to light the hidden and secret motives of the human heart, specifically with regards to our religious profession and whether or not it is true or false. And so the prophet goes on to tell us that God is going to judge us as human beings according to how we deal with our fellow human beings. He doesn't say that the final judgment is going to analyze whether or not you've spent X number of minutes or hours in Bible study each day, although Bible study is important. The litmus test for the judgment isn't how often or how long you pray, although prayer is important. The litmus test for the judgment is not going to church and giving money, although going to church is important and supporting the cause of God is important. But none of those things are an accurate revelation of the human heart because all of those things can be faked. We can pretend our way through religious observances. So God says the real test of what's going on in your heart as a human being is how you deal with those that are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in the world around you. This is the means by which God will investigate, if you will, in a kind of pre-advent judgment, the claims that we make to be his followers. Christianity itself will come under the examining eye of God and of Christ because Christianity itself is in danger of being so self-deceived, so theologically and doctrinally deceived that we miss the entire point of the teachings of Jesus and the apostles. One of the ways in which Christianity has been inclined toward theological confusion, Babylonian confusion, is that we have emphasized personal and private salvation over the corporate salvation of covenantal relationship with the people in the community around us. We live in a time when the emphasis has been placed upon getting me, myself, and I out of hell into heaven after this life is over. But the biblical view, the view of the prophets, the view of Jesus, the view of the apostles, is that personal salvation has practical effect in the community. In other words, if I am truly experiencing personal salvation, that personal salvation will not be private by any means. It will spill over in the way I see my fellow human beings, in the way I feel what they're feeling, and more concretely, in my actions toward my fellow human beings who are in the most vulnerable and disadvantaged positions in life. 
This is the true question, the significant question, the specific question that is hanging before the universe in the final judgment. Whereas we're inclined under a, a theological misconception to be obsessed with me, myself, and I salvation, the question of scripture is more, how can I know that I'm actually right with God presently in this world? Not post-mortem, but in this present life. How can I know that I'm right with God here and now? And Jesus, in his final teaching before he went to the cross and was crucified, and then resurrected and ascended to heaven, Jesus, in his final teaching, tells us exactly how we can know if we are right with God. In fact, he tells us how he will know in the final judgment if each of us is right with him and with God. This final teaching is in Matthew chapter 25, and I want you to look at it with me very carefully here. Even if you're familiar with this passage, look at it again with new perspective considering the present moment in which we find ourselves. In chapter 25 and verse 31, check this out, Jesus says that when the Son of Man, he's referring to himself, comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, he, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. This is judgment language. Jesus is saying that there's going to be a final judgment, that, that, that preceding my second coming, I'm going to engage in a process of judgment, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. This is fascinating because the judgment in this passage is for nations, for corporate groups. I'm an American, and the American nation will come corporately under the assessing, examining eye of God in the judgment. We do not merely stand before God as individuals in the judgment. We stand before God corporately, as we're going to see, because it is our corporate dealings with one another, our, our communal, our covenantal dealings with one another that are the true revelation of what's really going on in our hearts, regardless of what our religious profession may be. So all nations are going to come before Jesus to be judged, and he's going to divide the nations, as well as the individuals of the nations, between sheep and goats. The word judgment is a fascinating word. I've used it a few times, and so I want to make sure we understand what we mean with our usage of this word. The word judgment simply means to see things the way they really are. It is a word that means discernment or disclosure. If you say of a friend of yours, hey, uh, my friend Mike has good judgment, you mean he has good discernment. He thinks clearly and he can distinguish between right and wrong, true and false. The judgment is the process by which Jesus evaluates and brings to light everything that truly is. Whatever is authentically going on in my heart and in my mind will be brought to the exposure of the judgment. I will stand before God and see myself as I am and be seen as I really am by all others. And we, as a nation, will stand before God corporately and be seen in our whole history for who and what we really are. Now, this is going to become significant as we continue, but I just want us to be clear that when we speak of judgment, the judgment can be positive, it can be a favorable judgment, it can be negative, it can be a disfavorable judgment. It all depends on what is discerned. It all depends on what is disclosed because, again, as I mentioned earlier, religion oftentimes can be used as a mask and a costume. We can go through the outward forms 
of religion, attending church, giving money, singing praise songs, offering prayers, studying the Bible, engaging in apologetic arguments for our various doctrines. And none of that is in and of itself bad or wrong. In fact, all of those things in and of themselves can be good and edifying. But all of those things can lend themselves to self-deception. So the real question in the judgment, the real issue that is brought before our own consciousness and before the whole universe in the judgment is not whether or not we have engaged in external rituals of Christian religion. No, Jesus tells us exactly what the standard of the judgment will be. Watch this in chapter 25 again of Matthew and verse 33. And he will set the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left, the right and the left, the sheep and the goats. This is language again of judgment. The right hand where the sheep are, well, the right hand, indicates favor and pleasure. The left hand indicates disfavor, displeasure. Jesus is saying that in the judgment, God is ultimately going to be favorable toward and pleased with some people, and he's going to be displeased with other people. And if that sounds like a harsh picture of God, I want to remind you that any psychologically well-adjusted person would experience a sense of disfavor toward wrongs that are committed right in their presence against another human being. In other words, you have to be a psychopath to witness suffering and feel nothing. So if God is psychologically well-adjusted, and of course, of course he is, we would expect God to look upon the behaviors of human beings and to be happy with some behaviors and to be unhappy with other behaviors. And Jesus makes this very clear. So then he says, the king, he's speaking of himself, will say to those on the right hand, watch this carefully, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus is inviting a certain group of people, the sheep, into the everlasting bliss and happiness of eternity future, into the eternal kingdom but he explains exactly why he has judged them with pleasure. He explains exactly why he has judged them with favor and invited them into the blessedness and bliss of the eternal kingdom. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Now, Jesus names six groups of people that are vulnerable and disadvantaged in any society. But he's not naming these six in order to give us a legalistic list to follow, excluding all other vulnerable and disadvantaged people. He doesn't want us to simply narrow down these six categories as those people that we will go out of our way to see and help. Jesus is rather giving us what we might refer to as a representative list, a representative list of the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in any given context. So we need to ask ourselves the question, who's the most vulnerable and disadvantaged? And that's exactly where this passage of Scripture points. And the king will answer and say to these sheep who are entering into the everlasting kingdom, he says to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, now watch this. In the previous verses, the sheep, the righteous, those who are going into the blessedness of the eternal kingdom, they're incredulous when Jesus says that I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me, etc. They're like, well, we don't remember encountering you in that predicament, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, anytime you encounter anybody who is on the downside of privilege, you are encountering me. 
Just let that register, you guys. The least of these, Jesus says, that's where you'll find me in the most personified form. I'm, in a sense, embodied in the most needy in any given nation or community. The least of these. And Jesus says, they're my brethren. These are my brothers and sisters. These are those with whom I am in sympathy. So think about it this way. It is in the nature, Jesus is essentially saying that it is in the nature of God's love Ponder this. It is in the nature of God's love to live in empathetic solidarity with the disadvantaged. Now, this is so absolutely crucial for us to understand. Because if we simply engage in religious profession, I'm a Christian. If we simply engage in external forms of religion, Bible study, prayer, corporate worship, singing songs, giving a little bit of money, there's a sense in which we can go through those religious rituals in order to kind of let ourselves off the hook in our conscience so that we can be self-deceived and feel like, hey, I'm okay, I gave that money. I'm okay, I prayed that prayer. I'm okay, I read my Bible. I'm okay, I go to church. But Jesus says, listen, if you really want to locate the heart of God, if you want to be at the center of God's heart, then you will enter into empathetic solidarity with the most disadvantaged, which means we need to ask ourselves the question, the probing, and I might add sometimes uncomfortable question, what then is the truest measure of my connection with God? Well, I think that it's evident that Jesus is saying, with unequivocal language, that I am most at the center of God's heart when my heart is broken for what breaks his heart. Listen, who are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in your situation, in my situation? I know there are people around the world who are watching this who aren't American citizens, but the truth applies no less to you. I'm asking the question of myself as an American. The nations, corporately, will come before Jesus in judgment. That is to say that the United States of America as a whole, its entire history up to this present moment and the moments to follow, will come in review before the all-searching eye of God. I am an American, and so I have to ask myself the question. If I am to be straight with myself, if I am to be honest with myself, if I am to deal with myself faithfully, I need to ask myself the question, who are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people group in America? And I'm going to suggest to you that this present moment that we're in of massive social upheaval all across the American landscape is crying out to us, screaming out to us, that the most vulnerable among us are our African brothers and sisters, our African-American brothers and sisters. Listen, the most vulnerable and disadvantaged among us are those who are presently crying out to us to be seen, to be heard. And they're crying out for others who are not African-American to cry out in solidarity with them. I'm making a clumsy effort at doing that. In fact, I have to tell you, quite honestly, I'm nervous because I don't want to say anything that would cause additional pain to my black brothers and sisters. And so I'm tripping all over my tongue here and slaughtering what I intend to say. I'm nervous because I don't want to add more pain, and yet I feel compelled to say what I have to say. And I believe that our black brothers and sisters are the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people group in America. And I think the current cultural moment, the current social moment is revealing that unequivocally. And among our black brothers and sisters, I'm gonna suggest to you 
that the most vulnerable people group in America are black females, black girls and women. All the way back in 1962, Malcolm X observed the following. Whatever you think of Malcolm X, whatever your opinion happens to be of some of his methods and techniques of protest at his time, he did in fact speak the truth oftentimes with a level of clarity that needs to be heard. And Malcolm X at one point said, the most disrespected person in America is the black woman. He went on to say, the most unprotected person in America is the black woman. In fact, the most neglected person in America, he says, is the black woman. And we have actual concrete data that demonstrates to us that in fact, black girls and women are the most neglected group in American society. The African American Policy Forum from 2000 to 2010 conducted a massive study that revealed the following. Income disparity under the first heading reveals that single black women have the lowest net worth of any people group, any social group in America. Black women have the lowest net worth. Add to that that black women ages 18 to 24 have the highest unemployment rate among women nationwide. And you can sense and, 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 and get a picture of how absolutely traumatic it must be to be a black girl, a black woman in American society. With regards to marriage, 55% of black women will never marry. 55% of black women will not marry compared to 49% of Latino women and 34% of white women. And this too, this too is, is revealing to us that where there is often a longing for a, a family unit and family cohesion, there is oftentimes not the opportunity or the privilege of entering in to that kind of cohesive family unit to the tune of 55% of black women. And therefore, we should not be surprised on the level of mental health to discover that 67% of black girls indicate signs of depression. 67%, you guys, showing signs of depression compared to 40% of Latina girls and 31% of white girls. This should break our hearts. This should tune us in. This should arouse in us a sense of desire to intervene and to help. Homicide rates among women, well, girls and women, ages 10 to 24. This is astounding. Among this age group, black girls beginning at age 10 up to age 24, have the highest rate of homicide among females and a higher rate of homicide than white and Asian men. That is to say that black girls and women are murdered at a greater rate than any other people group in America. What about philanthropic investment? Are, are people putting actual money into black girls? Well, this is fascinating. In that decade period from 2000 to 2010, $100 million was invested in black and brown boys and various kinds of community programs, educational programs, various kinds of, of, of financial aid was provided in order to elevate the quality of life and the opportunity for black and brown boys. I'm going to add that $100 million is a pittance. It's nothing compared to the need even among black and brown boys. But notice by comparison that during that same decade period of time, only a million dollars was invested in black and brown girls. A hundred million dollars versus one million dollars in a decade of philanthropic money given to elevate the quality of life for black girls. 
and black women? Again, this picture should break our hearts and mobilize us to action, tangible action that is worthy of the inspecting eye of Jesus in the final judgment. Recently, I encountered this study that came out of Georgetown uh, University Law School called Girl Interrupted. I mean, just the title alone is heart-wrenching. What has to happen for a little girl growing up to have her maturation process interrupted, imposed upon? The subtitle indicates that little girls, little black girls are experiencing uh, a, a phenomenon in which their girlhood is actually being erased. Erased, why? Because they're experiencing a phenomenon that has come to be called adultification bias. How does a little black girl grow up with her girlhood erased? By being perceived as and related to as older than she actually is. The study goes on to give us one statistic after another indicating that black girls beginning in kindergarten at five years of age, that black girls from five years and on through elementary school and junior high school and high school are generally perceived to be and related to as if they are older than they actually are. They are punished at a higher percentage rate than girls that are white and Latina. They are dealt with more harshly. They are related to as if they are more sexually mature than they actually are, and therefore they undergo sexual violation at a higher percentage rate than Latina and white girls. This is phenomenal, and it represents the imposition of trauma on the young psyches of black girls. And that trauma then pans out in all of the other statistics that we just mentioned, having to do with marriage and, and with mental health and employment and the capacity to get a job and earn money. All of these things are connected, you guys. Black girls are experiencing a manner of relating to them that is producing traumatic outcomes. So I'm gonna to suggest to you in summarizing that data, and I think the data proves this, that black females are the most poor, alone, depressed, murdered, and overlooked group in America, you guys. I mean, think this through for a minute. We have these beautiful young girls that are coming up in our nation, and our nation will be judged for this, according to Jesus. In our very nation, we have young black girls who are being raised up in such a way that from girlhood, they are undergoing trauma that sets the course of their lives. But the moment you begin to speak, in any kind of advocating voice for black men and women in America, you will always be faced with pushback. And the pushback alone is painful to watch, to experience, and to hear. Right now, in our present cultural moment, when there is so much pain, so much heart cry, so much, hey, please feel what I feel, see me as I am, in the midst of all of that, so often, even the Christian heart is cold and hard and so driven to find excuse and to push back that we lose sight of the forest for the trees. We lose sight of the, the big situation of the, the black community because we can point to whatever little pieces of data that make us feel okay about the situation. Well, I'm here to tell you we shouldn't feel okay with the situation. Our black brothers and sisters are hurting, and in the midst of that pain, Jesus says that we are called upon 
to enter into empathetic solidarity, to, to, to action that produces an alleviating of the pain and the heart cry of those who are suffering. We are witnessing generational trauma play out before us. The current situation that we are witnessing is not happening in a vacuum. These protests are not manifesting out of thin air. They are the result of, of, of year after year and decade after decade, literally century after century of un addressed disparity and inequality and, in many cases, abuse. And so we need to pause and take a deep breath and think very carefully before we simply come up with little bits of information that we think overturns that heart cry. When somebody is hurting, that is no time to push back on their pain with bits of information that oftentimes are simply misinterpreted anyway in order to make ourselves feel okay with the situation. The most common thing that I'm hearing now, and I've heard it for years, is that we have a bigger problem than the plight of black men and women and the inequality and the disparity of resources that, that are applied to the situation that they are experiencing. We have a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is black-on-black -black crime. Black-on-black -black crime, that's the bigger problem. That's the real problem. If, if black people would just stop committing crimes against one another, everything would turn positive for them. It would all go in a positive direction. I'm gonna to suggest to you that the data actually overturns the very notion of black-on-black -black crime. Now, before you shut me off, because you may be among those who are so certain because you've seen various bits of data or different memes that give this concept, before you shut me down, hear me out when I say to you that the very idea of black-on-black -black crime is suspect by the data. And here's what I mean. This is gonna take a moment, but please track with me here. Regarding black on black crime, we need to take into consideration the following. First of all, 13% of the US population is black. That's both men and women. About 47, 48 million people in the United States of America. 13% of the US population are black. Now watch this very carefully. Black persons did commit 53% of the murders in 2000. And 17. Now that's the part of the data that is seized upon and isolated from the bigger picture, but we're going to put it in the bigger picture. So yes, in fact, black persons did commit 53% of the murders in 2017. And black people themselves find it very difficult to deal with this reality. They are they are themselves in agony over this statistic. The last thing we need to do is seize upon it and weaponize it against them, especially when that data in isolation creates a false picture. And here's what I mean. Watch this very carefully. So then, from these two bits of data, we can draw this conclusion, right? So then, 13% of the population committed 53% of the murders. 13% of the population, that is the black population of America, committed 53% of the murders, right? Well, the answer is no, wrong. That's a wrong way of slicing the data. It's a wrong way of perceiving the data, and here's why. Listen, 0.10% of black people committed 53% of the murders in 2017. Do you hear what I'm saying here? 13% of the population, that is black men and women, did not commit 53% of the murders. A very small percentage of black individuals committed those murders. Are you still tracking with me? Now watch this. That means that 99.9% .9 of black people did not commit murder in 2017. 
it would be difficult for you to even come across a violent black person in American culture because the numbers indicate that the vast majority, 99.9% of black people in America are not engaged in the committing of the murders that fall under the statistic of 53%. A very small percentage of the 13% of black Americans committed those murders. Well, compare that to these statistics. 0.005% of white people committed murder in 2017. Now pause there and think about that for a minute. The number is not significantly different from the small percentage of black people who committed murders in 2017. There is a difference, but it's not a huge difference. And here's the point. The difference isn't even the point. The point is that white people murder people who are white, and yet you've never heard of white on white crime. Why? Pause and hold that thought in mind. This statistic tells us that similarly with the black community, 99.9% .9 of white people did not commit murder in 2017. The vast majority of the black population did not commit murder. The vast majority of the white population did not commit murder. The murders are committed by a very small percentage of each respective group. It's not, I'm gonna summarize for the sake of clarity, it's not the black 13% of the population that committed 53% of the murders in 2017. That's an inaccurate perception. It's not the black 13% that committed those murders. It's the 0.010% of black people that committed 53% of the murders in 2017. So let's ask a series of simple questions. Do black people commit crimes against black people? Well, the answer is yes just as white people commit crime against white people. Yes, black people commit crime against black people. Just as white people commit crime against white people. Are black criminals targeting black people with their crime? Is that what's going on here? Are black people targeting black people with their crime? Well, of course not. Of course not, listen, listen. Why have you never heard of white on white crime? I'll tell you why. Because there is no such thing as white on white crime. Do white people commit crimes against white people? Yes, but we never categorize it as a racial equation. We just say that people committed crimes against people in that community, in that area, in that geographical area of the nation, and there is no such thing as black on black crime, which again, pause, that is not to say that black people do not commit crimes against black people. Black people do commit crimes against black people. But listen, it's not a racial equation. It's not black people committing crime against black people because they're black, listen. There is crime of proximity and there is crime of expediency. That is to say, listen, any given criminal is going to commit crime against those who are readily at his disposal to commit crime against. A criminal is going to commit crime against those who are in close proximity to him in his community. So white people, in Boston, who commit crimes against white people, we don't call that white on white crime, we don't call that, oh, Irish on Irish crime. No, it's just crime. It's just crime, you guys. It's just bad people doing bad things to the people closest to them and readily at their disposal to commit crimes against. Black people commit crimes against black people, but it's people who are inclined to commit the crimes committing crimes against people who are in close proximity to them. So when we come back to Jesus, 
he wants us to understand that the judgment that goes in a positive direction for, the, for those who enter into empathetic solidarity with the most vulnerable and disadvantaged will go in a very negative direction for those who quibble about data in order to harden their hearts against the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in our midst, right here, right now. Jesus says, then he, that is Jesus himself, the great judge of all the earth, will also say to those on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I mean, this is rather ominous. This is rather harsh. Jesus is saying the goats are going to be eternally destroyed in the flames of the final conflagration of the judgment. Depart from me. Depart from me? Yeah, depart from me because you're not with me. The, the context of the passage is that in order to be with Jesus, really with Jesus, not merely in religious profession, to really be with Jesus is to be with the least of these, my brethren, he says. To be with Jesus is synonymous with being with the most vulnerable and disadvantaged people in our world. So Jesus goes on and he explains to them why it is that his judgment is one of displeasure and disfavor against them. Because I was hungry and you didn't give me any food. I was thirsty and you didn't give me anything to drink. I was a stranger. You didn't take me in. I was naked. You didn't clothe me. I was sick. I was in prison. You didn't come to visit me. And at this point, of course, they're thinking, wow, what, what, what? And they go on to say, well, Jesus, when did we encounter you in these dire circumstances? Because if we would have known it was you, Jesus, we would have helped you. And there they've revealed the darkness of their hearts. There they've revealed that the gospel has not gotten into the deep inner fabric of their thinking and feeling and relating process. There they have revealed that they have had a profession of godliness and of Christianity while denying the power thereof to transform the heart and the life from the inside out. If we, have no, if we had known it was you, I mean, if we had just known it was you, Jesus, we, 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 we would have helped. And then Jesus says to them, assuredly, I say to you, you've missed the whole point. In as much, in as, much as you did it not, for one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not for me, to me. You overlooked me by overlooking them. You left me at heart. In the deep inner recesses of your soul, you've been separated from me all along, even though you've been going through the motions. You've made the outward profession of Christianity, and you sing praise songs, and you give a little bit of your money, and you, you pray prayers, and you read your Bible, and you argue theology in order to prove yourself right, and you've done all of that, but you've not done the very thing, the only thing that really is a clear indicator that you are one with me at heart. You overlook the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in your world. And in that, you overlooked me. And then Jesus says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Some of the, the most serious and, and sobering words of Scripture, and they come from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus says, that a people group, a category of humanity, the goats as opposed to the sheep will go away into everlasting punishment. That is to say, they will enter into a final destruction from which there will be no recovery, no return. They will cease to exist. The punishment will be final and irrevocable. 
Yes, Jesus, meek and mild Jesus, Jesus, with his heart of compassion and kindness, Jesus said this serious and sobering thing. Jesus did. And he's telling us with language that is unmistakable that all who do not dot, 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 fill in the blank, all who do not what will go away into everlasting punishment. What has Jesus taught us? All who do not stand in solidarity, empathetic, active solidarity with the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in our nation, in our world, will go away into everlasting punishment. These aren't my words. These are the words of Jesus. These are words that Jesus is hoping will wake us up at the deepest level of our consciousness that will wake up inside of us feelings of empathy, maybe for the first time in our lives, for those who are crying out in agony all around us. How can we know that we're right with God? Well, summarizing the teachings of Jesus in his Matthew 25 sheep and goats discourse, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, the German poet and, and author, philosopher, he said it so well. You can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. Think about that, you guys. Ponder the fact that we, each one of us, as we come before the inspecting eye of Jesus in the final judgment, as Jesus looks upon us, he's looking for something specific. He's looking for how you and I will deal with and treat and minister to the needs of those who can do nothing in return. If I'm in a position of advantage, and I am, and I do not use my influence and my voice and my resources and my hands and my feet to bring relief, to minister health and healing and restoration to black men and women in my own nation, then I am preparing myself to be found wanting in the final judgment of mankind when all nations will stand before Jesus and he will say, the only thing that I was really looking for was how you would treat the least of these, my brethren. Everything you did or didn't do for them was a revelation of your true position toward me. How can I know? How can I know that I'm right with God? I can only know that I'm right with God by the way I think and feel and act toward the most vulnerable and disadvantaged in my world. We are currently, we are currently experiencing a revelatory moment in American consciousness and, and it's going viral, worldwide consciousness to some significant degree. And, and in this moment, we find ourselves kind of experiencing maybe a rehearsal for the final pre-advent judgment. Maybe right now, Jesus is, is looking into our hearts and, 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 and asking us to look into our hearts to find out what's really there. Because, because right now, a people group is crying out in pain. And all of us, all of us will find ourselves responding to that heart cry in one way or another. And in that, we are being judged in this moment, preparatory to the future judgment. And yet, the Savior of the world says, hey, wait a minute. No matter how cold, how distant, 
how hard, how self-justifying you've been. Come to me. Come to me. Enter in to my salvation. Not merely a personal salvation, but a corporate salvation, a covenantal salvation. Enter in to my heart, and when you do, you will find yourself entering in to solidarity with the pain that is pulsating in the hearts of the people all around you. I want to invite you, in the light of these things that we've discovered that I have said you know, so stumblingly, I, I have tried to represent to you what, from my heart, I think is important in this moment. Would, would you just pause with me to ask, that Jesus would give us his heart, his heart in this present moment of social pain and upheaval in the world all around us. Father in heaven, thank you for the straight teachings of Jesus, although they make us uncomfortable. We pray, Lord, that we would be willing to hear what he has said to us at the deepest level of our hearts. Father, we pray that you would wake us up at the deepest level of our, of our consciousness, Lord. Wake us up with compassion and empathy and understanding. Father, incline our hearts to feel what you feel when you look upon the world as it is right now. Incline our ears to hear the heart cry of those who are in pain. Father, hush our self-justification. Silence everything in us that would point the finger at them rather than taking on board a clear, heartfelt, investigation of our own motives. And God, make us more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, so that when we stand before him in the final judgment, he will look upon us as sheep and not goats and place us on the right hand and then usher us into the blessedness and bliss of the eternal kingdom. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, and brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we wanna encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we want to invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.